Okay, uh, welcome to this introduction to Unity, uh, the game engine. Uh, great to see you all here. Great to know that there's other people watching in Norway, Russia, and Germany. Uh, look forward to meeting some of you next week when you come over. And uh, I hope that this broadcast is uh, clear so you can hear and follow along. Um, so I'm just going to introduce what Unity is. Unity I've described as a, a game engine. Um, it's a, a software that allows you to create applications um, for a variety of uh, platforms. And uh, it's optimized to take a lot of the pain out of the graphic and um, game programming that you may want to do. So there's a lot of the back end which works with the, the rendering of 3D objects uh, and that sort of thing that you don't actually have to deal with at all. So they've kind of packaged up a neat system whereby you can work with game objects and scripts and build up scenes to uh, make it work. So it's really just to acquaint you with the software package um, and give you an idea of where to look and how to work with it. It is a little bit different to working with uh, compiling scripts because it is uh, slightly visual in the way that you're working with uh, scripts rather than um, classes. You do use classes as well. But some of the concepts are different in this because it's a visual media. So, for example, the first concept we're going to talk about is the concept of scenes. So, each uh, element that you're making is referred to as a scene. So we'll, we'll create a scene and we'll put our game objects in that and then we'll program that to uh, have the interactions between the objects uh, and between the user that we want. Uh, I'm talking about objects here. Everything that is in a scene is referred to as a game object. So everything's an object and it can have uh, scripts attached to it and these are called components. So a game object in its very essence is uh, referred to as a transform and then it won't have any rendering, it won't have any other elements to it. But if it's a 3D object, like a cube, you will have uh, rendering capability to actually have it show within the scene as you watch it. Another game object is a camera. The camera's very important in 3D uh, modeling, animation, and also in game engines. The camera is the item that defines what is shown to the viewer, what's on the viewer's screen. So the camera, if you're, if you're in a, a first-person shooter, the camera will actually be the player's head. So you'll kind of walk along and you'll see the view of the character through that camera. So we need to get used to working with these elements. If you've worked in a 3D software package, like Blender or Maya or... Um, any, any soft 3D software package, you probably will have come across these items already. Uh, the final concept on this top line is scripts. There's two, there's actually three ways of, sorry, I've gone past that one, three ways of working with uh, programming languages in Unity. The most common and the most popular one is C Sharp. C Sharp is a very robust software uh, programming language, and you can use classes, uh, you declare your variables, it works in a, a very normal way if you're used to programming languages. A slightly easier scripting language is uh, JavaScript, which they actually call Unity Script, because it's slightly adapted from JavaScript. Some people start off using the uh, JavaScript equivalent because you don't have to declare your variables, you don't have to say what type of variable you're using. So it does make it slightly simpler um, in some ways, but a lot of the examples, and when you get into certain areas, uh, C Sharp will be a benefit to, to use as well. Um, and there was a third one, uh, which I won't mention, I think it's called Boo, um, but it's not used really, it was one that was developed just by Unity themselves. So we're using established um, C Sharp scripts with this demonstration, um, and there's a lot of information on those. Then we're going to have project files. So within, when you start a new Unity project, you're going to have a, a, a folder with um, assets, project settings, um, so a library of uh, uh, metadata that it will use with, with your files. Um, so it can compile your scenes. 
Um, and these are just set up in a single folder. And this is really useful, and this, this is really what's called a parent-child relationship with objects. So a single object can have child objects grouped with it. So by making these connections, you can keep objects in a, a hierarchy, and this is very useful as we'll find out later when you're broadcasting commands to a group of objects. And lastly, one of the most useful uh, things that you'll, you'll need to get your head around is the inspector. And this is really looking at the properties of the objects when you're working with them. So I've been advised that uh, the best Unity version to use is 2017.4 uh, LTS. Um, I actually have mostly been using uh, 5.6.6, but that's for, uh, I will update them when I need to uh, bring them into a different, into the holodeck. Uh, so, so which one are we having? The, the top one? The top one, I'm told it was, sorry, let me just go back to the installs. The 2017.4. Um, long term support. And um, so you can get that from the Unity download archive. Uh, I've also been advised to install the Unity Hub, which allows me to run different editors at the same time. So I'm working to my lowest common denominator, which is 5, and then I will update it when I need to release it, um, or use functions within that. So within the Hub, I can create a new project, and it's asking me which version to use. I'm going to use a 3D template. You can do 2D. Um, but I would recommend, even if you are working on a, a 2D project, to consider sticking with a 3D uh, template anyway, and it gives you the, the extra dimensions which you just wouldn't use with that. So, first of all, I'll give it a, a um, project name, and then I'll give it a, a place to save, and just click somewhere on your on the system, I'm going to put mine on the desktop and select that folder and it will create a folder on my desktop which will have my uh, setup file in there. So if I go and look at my finder, I can see that uh, it should have with date modified, Unity intro project. And I have these three, uh, three folders that I'm not going to use, I'm not going to touch these, the library, project settings, and temp, but I am going to put all of my work into assets, which is currently empty. So that's the folder which you put the assets that you're going to work with inside Unity as you're working. Assets are a, um, a term used for anything, any graphics, in this case, it, is, it does include C Sharp scripts, um, any resources that you'll use within your scene. So this opens up Unity. <coughs> um, I think we, well, we can see the whole thing there, pretty much. Um, the inspector, as I say here, is empty. We've got an empty project, but we have a hierarchy here as well. So this is a scene hierarchy. In this case, with this version of Unity, it's added in the camera and a directional light um, to start with. Well, if I save this scene, just call it intro, then I will have an item in my project. So this is down here, this is the item I can open and close when I'm working. I can also create objects in the project window here. So if I want to have a folder for my scenes, I can create a folder there, and I can drop that one in as well. I could also create a, a folder for scripts. That one's actually gone inside the other one, so I can drag that out and move that one around. <clears throat> so I have a folder highlighted, and I tell it to create a C-sharp script. Then that will create that within that folder. When the C-sharp script's created, gives you uh, the name highlighted in blue. You can uh, rename this, so I'm just call that intro script. And this is important because when you open that, um, you may use this in uh, the Microsoft 
on Windows, you might open it into their, um, their code editor. But on Mac, it's running on Mono Develop. So you can see here, it's actually inserted public class intro script. And that's important because the script, the C sharp script, has to have the same class name, has to have that name as the file name. Otherwise, that won't work. It'll give you an error. Um, so, <clears throat> this is the scene. You can create separate scenes and you can load different scenes. So, you may have a, a splash image at the beginning when you're loading a loading screen. You might have a menu scene, you might have a, a, a main loop which might be your game or it might be your application on a main loop. Um, and you can have uh, a group of scenes that you can import or open up when you need them. When you're working with objects in here, <coughs> you can create a certain amount of objects in here. So you've got assets and you can create from this list here. Um, some of the main ones you would do are <coughs> start script, uh, prefabs and scenes. Um, but you can also go to the game object menu, and this is where you might be able to open up uh, <coughs> some of these menus and create a cube for a 2D object. So let's just create a cube there. We've also got lights, um, audio sources, and video player. I tend not to use that very much, and user interface items as well. So if I create a cube, that will appear in the scene. I've got the, uh, the viewport window here, which allows me to move around. I'm holding down the Alt key, clicking, uh, well, I've got a trackpad here, but clicking, left clicking and moving around to uh, rotate around the object. If I use the scroll button, uh, rotate the scroll button on the mouse, or drag two fingers on the mouse, uh, the trackpad, that will zoom into the object as well. I've also got a shortcut of pressing F. So I've got an object selected, and I want to focus on that. I might be um, looking somewhere else. So that'll focus that, and that'll bring it into the center of my view. That's really useful. We've also got this gizmo on the side, which gives you the orientation. We're working in a Y-up type scene. So anyone who's working in an engineering perspective may have to change the Z up to Y-up when you're bringing data into this, or bringing objects in. Um, it's because it's a media entertainment software, we're imagining it's a screen and the X and Y dimensions are the dimensions as you look at a screen, rather than in engineering you would look down on the ground and you would map um, a, uh, a map of a city using X, Y along there. So Z takes you away from the camera, this blue item here. If you haven't used these gizmos before, um, We've got the move tool. You can pick up the that single triangle, which uh, is the green one there, or go to the blue one that highlights in yellow, and we can move it in a single axis. You can see that coming up there. This is really useful because you can uh, using a two D mouse. It's very awkward to try and um, move objects uh, in three D. So now you can see this isn't in the center of my screen, and this is where using the F key really helps. So you can focus on that, and now I'll rotate around that object. So you could also use a null object as well. When we go to the game object menu, you would say create empty. This will allow you to put a single transform, that's what I mentioned at the beginning, a single transform without the other elements, the other components that you have on the cube. So the most basic game object is just a transform, so it has a position in space. I'm just going to zero this out, so I'm going to zero the x, y, and z coordinates on there. You also have rotation and scale, as you would in most uh, software packages. You can turn these on and off from the inspector, um, but the parenting and the hierarchies, if I take this cube and I drop it on top of the game object, that becomes a child of that game object. And then if I move the game object, rather than the cube. I'm just going to offset those slightly. So if I select the cube and move that, I can see that that's offset slightly, but I can also uh, move the game object. If I type in a coordinate there, it will move that uh, for me. So this is a way of collecting objects together if you, if you need to do that. So you may have more than one cube. I can duplicate that a few times. 
and have a few cubes in the same scene, and they were all under the same hierarchy. Very useful if you're creating a scene at several objects to have them nested in a game object. So if I rename this as game object scene, uh, I want to use the same term there. So as in the, the mise en scène, the, the set, I can turn that off and on when I need to use that or don't want to use it. So that's a really useful way of working and really recommended. So going back to my notes, um, I want to just first of all demonstrate how you can rapidly create uh, an application within Unity. So rapid ap application development, RAD, is something that isn't specific to Unity, but it's something that we can um, work with uh, very quickly. So there are standard assets in Unity for prototyping, creating characters, creating environments, and vehicles. So a package is a collection of game assets scripts and uh, models and prefabs, which we'll have to look at in a moment, um, that we can work with in um, creating this. So, if I return to the, the Unity environment, I'm going to start a new scene here, uh, saving the one that I've saved already, and I'll start by saving this, uh, grab demo, and what we can do now is we can import some of the standard assets. So I can say import package. You can import a custom package that someone may have exported for you. But in this case, I'm going to take some of the standard ones that are coming with Unity. First one there is prototypes. This will appear in my project window under standard assets. It gives me an option of what I want to import. I'm going to import all of it. I recommend you do that when you're starting off. But once you get more used to working with Unity, you may be able to streamline your, your workflows and projects if you know exactly what you want. So it's compiling these into the right format for the platform I'm working with. Now I can see in here I've got uh, a folder called prototyping. Within that I've got models. If I highlight those, I can, I can see uh, the details of them. If I just Bring the collapses down slightly. Uh, are you supposed to remind me to uh, call the window? Yeah, <laughs> um, I've got a way of zooming that. But within this folder here, in the models, we can uh, we can drop these into the scene, and we've got a, a certain amount of models that we can work with. The better thing to do, though, is to work with the prototypes, the prefabs out of prototypes. So. The prefabs are game objects that have been saved for reusing. So you might be able to uh, program these to appear when you need them um, and instantiate them when you need to. But uh, So for now, I'm just going to take a floor prototype, and it says floor prototype 64 by 1 by 64. And I'm going to drop that into the hierarchy here. And you can see that I get a, uh, a grid, floor grid within that. That's something that I can start building on as well. The other type of prototype is a ramp. I can drop that one in. So I've got a small ramp in there. I'll just place that off to the side. Uh, a house prototype. Um, that looks quite big. I'll just try I'll press F on the keyboard and find that one. Um, and move that out. It's gone behind the camera, so I'll bring that off into the distance down here. So, you can see that's just a house shape. So these are the kind of the scale of, of things that you might work with. A pickup prototype. This allows us to have objects in the scene that we're able to work with. Mm -hmm. I can't actually see that pickup prototype. Uh, um, things like pillars as well. So you can very quickly start building a scene that you can um, work with. Because prototypes not come with textures. These are mapped with grids, so you can actually, I mean, the idea is that you're working very quickly to prove the concept, and then you would swap the prototypes with final uh, 3D artwork afterwards. Ah, okay. So the concept here is really blocking out a scene uh, and being able to work before you've got the final asset. So if you're working in a big team, you'll be working with uh, a modeler, an animator, a lighting expert, programmer, there's a whole range of people you'll be working with. Um, 
but you'll be wanting to get on with the programming before you finish that, or you'll be wanting to work on the, the concept before, before everyone's done their, finished their jobs. So this just allows you to create an environment that you can work in. So now we've got a scene, we, we want to have interaction with that. So another thing we can do is look for characters. Um, so if I bring this one in, if I just import the whole lot again, this will give you a, a, a basic uh, first person and third person character. So the difference is the first person you're looking through their eyes and they don't have a physical body or a virtual body. Uh, but the third person one is actually a character who will walk around and you'll be able to see where they are. So you'll look over their shoulder. So now we have a folder called characters. Um, it's also got one called rollerball. But uh, within that we have a prefab called FPS controller. I'm going to drop that into the scene here. And you can see there's a slight jump as I uh, added that to the scene in the, the game window here. This is the rendered camera for the game. I'm going to turn that one back on again. I'll turn it off and on. Um, and within the scene view here, I can see I've got a capsule with a camera icon on top. I'm just going to lift that up so it's above the ground. Um, what will happen is this will fall down to the ground uh, using gravity. And surrounding it is a sphere. That sphere is uh, guiding the, uh, the physics of the capsule or the collisions of the capsule. So now if I press play on the key, on the top bit there, you can start moving around the scene, uh, using the mouse to look around. Uh, I could probably walk up that ramp and fall off. Uh, there's no programming to make me die, so that's great. Um, and I'm starting to move around the scene already. You see it's actually got footsteps on this controller as well. And that allows me to start working with the with the looking around a scene already. So if I press escape on the keyboard, I will then get the mouse controller back and I can stop that scene. So a few other parts to this as well. We can uh, maximize on play. This will allow me to just see the game scene as I might when it's, um, it's fully, fully uh, um, exported as, a, as an application. Uh, but we can walk around there and we've got basic interaction. The other standard assets uh, I want to show you, I did talk about environment. I'll bring that in. That's a way you can create a terrain. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that, uh, but it does have some standard trees and that sort of thing that you can add into a, a scene. It also uses something called level of detail on the trees, which means that if the tree is in the background, it will use a lower resolution tree for that, and it will save on the rendering time. So this is an alternative way of creating an environment, um, and a lot of preset pieces will come in with that. I will also look at the uh, one on there, import package of vehicles, uh, which allows me to um, add a car to the scene, which is quite fun and it's quite easy to set up. I think it's got aeroplanes and it's got all sorts of different types of vehicles you might want to use. So these are already pre-made. So this is why Unity is very popular. It's very easy to get up and running with it and to create a, a scene. So this is why I'm demonstrating a rapid application. So this is only one scene in this application. And uh, I just want to talk through how we would build that into a, uh, an application as well. So we'll just let that one import, uh, then we will carry on. So do ask me questions as you go through. Um, and people who are in the room, you can type in questions and hopefully we'll pick up on those and be able to answer those as well. Uh, so again, from the standard assets, we now have vehicles, it's got aircraft and car, and again, I'll go to the prefab and I'm going to take the car and drop it into the scene. So if I turn off the first person controller, uh, highlight the car, and I just want to find that in my viewport here, so I'm pressing F. Now it's coming off screen, so I'm just going to zero out its parameters there. 
And so now I have a nice car, and the camera's not following it. So I can uh, start driving around as I go. So would you then attach the, like, the camera to that? The car, yeah. Yes, very much. Um, so this is where parenting is really useful. So I can take the main camera here, I can the drop it on top of the car, um, and now that will follow. So I might want to raise the uh, car up slightly, for the camera up slightly. Um, I'm going to give that a slightly higher view, and uh, I would probably rotate it. So along the top I've got the move, uh, or translate, rotate, and scale tools. If I find that... Are they on the left hand side? We can't see that. The scale rotate. It cuts off. Oh, I see them on, on the live stream. Yeah. So yeah, there's these three icons here <laughs> uh, that you can work with. Um, so I'm just going to uh, raise the camera up. I did before, but I've managed to reset that. Um, Would you be able to just bring the window into the middle of the screen? Oh, sorry. Uh, you can do it a bit, a bit more. Okay. There we go, like that. Okay. Now I can see everything. Just adjust the map. Bring that down slightly here as well. Yeah, that's optimal. Ooh, I'm okay, great. Uh, so now this camera will follow where this object goes. So as long as these items within it are controlled by the scripts on the car, and we can see the components on the car here: car controller, car user control. Uh, when I now press play, uh, I go forward. I should be able to follow the car around. There are skids on this. You can see actually when it programmed the skid when I needed to. And <laughs> such an exciting <laughs> car racing game. Uh, it is an instant game. Yeah. Ooh, we we fall off the edge. <laughs> uh, and that will take me to infinity. Um, <laughs> unless I have a collider, an object underneath that will detect a collision and take me back. Can you not just yeah. test the uh, Y offset? You can test that as well. So you've got a couple of options there. You would have a, uh, a script to either check how low it's gone or have a collider under the whole scene. Would that be in, under the car hierarchy, the script to test the Y? Uh, the scripts that are, t that are running this car yeah. are in the inspector here. So it's components that are added to the transform. So in that, in the car object, we've got, uh, we do have colliders in there so it can detect um, things, and they're very simplified. So it's using uh, uh, cuboid items to see if it's uh, bumping into anything. And then you've got the items like the wheels. Each has got a source, a sound source. Uh, it's got lights. Um, Particles for the smoke and uh, sky car. I don't know what that is, but um, to make these work, we've got these controller scripts. If I want to look at the script, I can double click on the script and it should open in my develop, which I think might have crashed because I've got a spinning wheel doom on there. <laughs> so I just force quit that one and start that one up again. Um, but I can variable. generally use public variables if you need to change it because you can do that in the inspector on the component. Um, so again, going back to the car, we can see these scripts. Some of these are public um, variables, so I can just type them here without going into the code, and I can change the top speed of the car, revs of it, um, and there's three scripts on here. One's the controller. Uh, the user control, so I imagine that's the key input, and then the car audio script, and that's got uh, game objects set up in that that you could change out as well. So these are dropped into the game objects. How do you manage collision bitmap? Collision what? Sorry? It's um, like scene kit, you have like collision bitmaps, so it's basically like a collision mask. Okay. So when two eye objects collide, right, you want to know if they, you want to test okay, you know a collision occurred, but you need to test which, with what it, uh, with what the object collided with. Yes. Um, you would do that with the collision handler. So what we've got in here uh, with the car, we can see these green items around the car are the collision.
colliders. If I just try and raise those up from the car, you can see what we've got. Oh, it's a square. Yes. Can you make them more delicate, like actually conform to the size of the object and form? Uh, absolutely. Um, but this is done to minimize the yeah, resolution. Yeah, of course. So, uh, and this functions perfectly as, as it should, but also it may allow the car to roll back over because it's got a tall, uh, tall top bit. So if it's falling, it may roll back into its upright position. So there's a few reasons why you'd work with that. And a lot of barriers and a lot of collision protection is made from cubes in this way. So it's very simple objects. Um, and there will be a collision handler that will uh, trigger um, when they collide and you can get the name of the object it's collided with. Oh, um, okay. So you have the, the phrase of uh, collider, uh, what, which object it's collided with and which object it's done. You can also use tags. So an object can have a tag. Um, and this is uh, like here we've got player game controller, main camera. So you can actually look for the tags. Uh, if it was a, a simple shooting game, it may be uh, you have enemy tab uh, tag, and you could check for that to see how you would handle it. So it may be an inanimate object, you may shoot a wall, and then you would have a, just a small explosion. But if it was actually um, uh, an agent or a, uh, another artificial intelligence item, you may want to have some other script attached to that. So in order to make this into an application, we need to build the project. So if we go to file, the file menu, we've got build settings, and within this, we can choose the platform we're working to. Um, I've got a lot of these loaded. You get the choice of which ones you want to work with as you um, start off. I've got it on PC, Mac, and Linux standalone target platform uh, Mac OS S. I can add the current scene. I will do a save just to save that scene. Um, and it's as simple as saying build and run. Um, so you may, if you're publishing it to um, a, the Android or iOS app stores, you may need to um, add in your license details for, for selling it or to putting it on there. But to build a desktop app, it's very simply uh, build and run, and I can just call it rad demo, press save, and that will package up everything that I'm using in that scene and all the elements I need to run an application. There are player settings. If you want to work with certain elements in a different way, you can click on player settings and you can set those up. Things like splash screens, this will come up with a Unity logo at the beginning. You may want to add your own logo in there. Um, if you have a license, you don't have to have the Unity logo on it. But when it starts up here, um, you get the option to start playing with it. Graphics quality. And um, if I press play, you get the splash screen here. And Amazing. we have a fully fledged application. What's that light? Sorry? There's that light beam, that blue light beam. I think it's, I think it's got headlights, or um, I didn't, didn't notice, so I was too busy enjoying driving. <laughs> <laughs> Just too immersed. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so potentially you can add more than one scene in here. So if I wanted to have uh, a collection of scenes, I could have a, a menu or something like that. You can drag them into here, and you can refer to these different scenes in code. So you can say, uh, um, load scene, I think it's a, the syntax, um, and then you can describe it in words or you can describe it by the index here, we've got zero and one. So zero is the first number, zero, one, and it will count through all the scenes as you go forward. Um, the player settings, this is where you can add in icons, default icons, put your company name in, product name, uh, and you can do, if you're working to telephones and things like that, you can tell it which orientation you want. Um, and uh, for desktops, you can say, does it run in the background or does it pause when you defocus that window? And you have separate settings for each of those. So again, that comes into the inspector there, um, and that can work with that. So that's really how, how to make an application. 
you, if you want to dig in, just one more thing while I'm doing that is uh, the build settings. If you did want to switch platform, click on the platform you wanted to go to, which is WebGL, and then you say switch platform. What will happen is probably will import all the assets again um, because it is using the metadata rather than the, the main source files that you put in there. So it is making, optimizing them for the platform you're working with. Then again, you can build, and that would uh, add demo web. Uh, and this time it will come in as a um, HTML file that will run in HTML5. So it's very versatile and works in that way. So that's really how you, how you set up an application and how you run it. Um, if you're working with augmented reality, which I know a lot of you are, uh, you may run that on a telephone, or you may um, run that in the HoloLens. <coughs> so you would have to change the platform to be the right item for that. Um, so we've, we've looked at the prefabs. Prefab is an object you've made that you can reuse or you can drop into a scene. So if you've got an item you, you spawned, like in a game you were spawning a, a character, a player or a, an enemy, um, you would spawn the prefab which has scripts attached to it already, not just the model on its own. That's a really useful way of, of working. Um, while that's exporting, I will go back to the slides. Um, and this slide here, rapid application development, Really, these are the seven steps that I've taken to make that application. So I've imported some packages, which gave me some assets to work with. I built an example scene, saved the scene, uh, went to file build settings, added the scene to the build, selected which platform, press build and run. You see it's still processing that in the background. Um, different platforms will take different speeds of processing. Um, just trying to move that out of the way of my slide. And, okay, so I want to move back to some, uh, some concepts. We've talked about prefabs already. Components are any aspect of your game object that you're adding to it. Most of the time your components will be scripts. So you're adding the C-sharp scripts to an object and they will run when that object appears in the scene. So if we go back to uh, the Mono develop, actually no, I have to wait for Unity to finish there. Um, unless I open this one called intro script. So that's probably quite small on the screen there, but you've got the public class declaration, intro script, and then you have void start, open close bracket, and then curly brackets. This is a, a function that will run when this script starts. So that's really useful for instantiating variables and setting up your um, setting up your scene and making something happen before everything's going. So you can set, set that up. And then the second one they have in here called void update. Void update is called every frame. So that's something you would have and you can create a, a kind of main game loop out of that as well. Um, if you're working with objects and you just want to wait till they collide. Sometimes using update isn't the most efficient way of checking for that. So you can have handlers to check for collisions and things like that instead. Um, just trying to see, yeah. No, I'm still working there. Um, but this will be, this script will become a component of a game object. Um, also on these slides that we will release, we have some links in here so you can get the lowdown on some of these aspects. So instead of having to read the whole manual, you should be able to follow these up. Uh, and there's things in there like instantiate game objects at runtime. So you can create objects. So if you had a, 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 an object that you wanted to have a projectile come from, you would instantiate an object um, and that would create a, a game object for you. The, slides, uh, components, you want to get deep, more detailed uh, understanding of components, uh, there's a link there as well. Um, so the other components are beyond the transform, everything has a transform, uh, but the other areas are added in there. Uh, 
components, you might want to address a component. Oh, here's, my, uh, here's my index. Okay, this might need to run in Firefox. Um, Does it use iframe for the HTML? I don't know. Um, I tend to use it only really for demonstrations. Uh, and so this can get full screen as well. It should load up pretty quick. Uh, screen. Um, what the controls are The controls are set up as inputs. So you've got an input forward, backwards, uh, left, right, um, and they're set up so that you don't have to define them. Okay, so it uses the uh, WASD yeah. or the arrow keys, or it will use a, a controller, a track uh, It's just automatic. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's automatic. You can override it uh, within Unity. So you do have uh, project settings, um, and one of those is input. So you can define that within there, but it will be based on the uh, axes of a controller and uh, using keys as well. Now the back, we've got a question. Um, so again, the other resources, script referencing and rigid bodies. Rigid bodies define the physics of an object. So this car is not going through the floor um, in the same way as uh, the first person controller didn't go through the floor. It's got a rigid body attached to it. So this means that uh, it's actually simulating physics on this object. If you don't have that turned on, it will just sink through the ground. Um, so if I find the car here, it's got rigid body here, and uh, also if I turn, I don't know if I can remove that. Probably won't like this because it's part of that. No, it does. Um, I'm expecting that. No, it just doesn't move. Um, buttons that are dropped down inside it that has the colliders or keeps it off the ground. So the rigid bodies are what you use to detect collisions and to stop things falling through um, other items because they're not physical items, they're virtual objects. Uh, so there's, a, there's some links there for you to follow up those aspects. Um, you may want to import your own models, uh, vehicles or characters, depending on um, what you're working with and you probably will want to import 2D artwork. That's bitmaps, JPEGs, PNGs, um, PSD files. Uh, these are, you can import all of these. Um, importing 2D artwork, you, have, you can define what you're using it for. So a sprite is what you'd use in a 2D game. This is a, an image that is a flat image that you'll present um, within your scene there. You've also got user interface graphics, so buttons and things like that and textures. Textures are the, the look of the model if you are trying to add um, color to that as well. Um, so I've got a few things prepared. If I want to uh, find... Oh, it's an interesting one. No, not that one. Uh, if I look at the <coughs> desktop and I prepared some assets earlier that I could work with. So I've got a couple of textures here. Um, I've got a few things in there, don't need that file, but uh, brick textures, and I can drag these into my project window. So this is the project window here, which is where all my assets are. So I'm going to drag the brick textures into my project window there. Um, I've also got some crates as well that I can attach to a cube. That brings those in. I can then uh, open the folder. And I can select the one which is called color, and I can check which texture type it is. This is on default. Um, so this is a, a normal image, uh, not a normal map, a normal image. So default, um, and that will, if I make a game object of a cube, um, I'll just bring that up slightly, I should be able to attach to this as well. I'm actually going to use the crate icon there and just drag it onto the cube in the hierarchy there and you can now see I've created a, a 
a crate out of this cube. If I select that, I can see the shaders on the right hand side as well in the inspector. I can drop that down, and this is using a standard shader. Um, I recommend most people stay with that unless you have a reason to. Um, and it can also take a normal map. So that item had a normal map as well. And that just gives the item some uh, depth, where, which isn't controlled by geometry, but is controlled by the, uh, the image itself. So uh, that would be the optimal way of, of making those graphics. Similarly, if I wanted to uh, add bricks to the house, I haven't got control over each face, so I'm going to do this uh, with the brick color. I'll drag it onto, drag it onto the house prototype there, um, and that will apply that to that um, item. So now I've got that, that item in there. As I'm driving around, if I'm driving around at normal level, that'd be fine. Again, I do have a normal map with this, so I can drop that onto the, the normal map um, as well. So that would give extra detail to that. Uh, you also have tiling. If you want to have them, if your, your text is too big for the item, you can tile it so it repeats. Um, that's basically how you bring in your UV uh, assets to that for, um, items in there. So uh, I haven't got a 3D model uh, ready. I haven't sorted that one out. Uh, but I will look in the uh, find the car in here, and I can bring that one back in. I'll just show you. You can just drag and drop that as well. So if I uh, the models here, if I right click that, I can say revealing finder. Um, that will show me the model, and these are FBX. You see, I've got an FBX meta file there as well. That's not um, anything I'm using. But the Sky Car FBX is the model, and if I was bringing in another one, you can bring in OBJs, uh, um, Blender files. There's a whole range of items you can bring in. Um, but you can, same way, just drag that into your scene here as well. There may be some adjustments you want to do to that. So once you've got the model in, um, you can scale the model. So it's coming in as a 0.01. So you can scale the model to fit your scene. Um, and you can create colliders. If you're bringing in a set, you will want to use this to generate colliders, otherwise the objects will fall for each other. It's a really important aspect of working with that. Um, also, potentially you brought in animations. As I click between the tabs, it asks me to press this apply button. Um, so I will apply that. I haven't changed the settings yet to generate collider settings. Um, and I have to move forward. So that's really drag and drop, bringing in items within that. If I wanted to use sprites for user interface items, I'm just going to do a find for button. Uh, must have a button somewhere. And so I'm going to bring in some of these PNGs into my scene here. And if I've got an item there and I want to use this as a sprite or a button, I go to Sprite 2D and UI. If you're creating a user interface, this is something that you can uh, work with in a few different ways. But if you want to create a button, uh, you have a UI element and we can create a button here and that will create ask me to apply my sprite and user interface um, selection there as well so that's making me a couple of objects a, a canvas which has the button and an event system so the canvas is everything that's in the ui <coughs> i'm seeing that in my main scene here button i'm not seeing it in my my scene unless i highlight the button and press F, and I'll focus on that, and you can see I've got this representation within my scene. So this is actually within my scene, but it's not directly related to that because it's overlaying the camera in here. So with this button here, if I want to change the, the sprite that's using it, um, because I've changed the um, item that I brought in already, um, I can select any of those items that we're working with. 
but some of these have come in with uh, the Unity demos, uh, and we can change that to be what we want. Also on the button, it's got the text. This is another um, component that is attached to a transform. So and I'm going to attach my intro script to that game object. Um, and then finally, I'm going to add in a public, uh, no, I'll just void a uh, function in here, a class in here that will make this run. So do button click, open close bracket, uh, curly brackets, and inside that, I'm going to use the line debug.log, and this will print a message to my console. Um, do button. So I can trigger this function from the button now. So this is where I would add my code to make that work. So this button will, once I've set this up properly, um, so I've got this on click um, section here in the inspector. If I add a function in there, I can drag this game object script. So this has to be in my scene to make this work. And then it gives me a list of the functions that are attached to that. So the game object, uh, intro scripts, and then I can look for the one that I'm looking for. So I think I may have to declare it as public. It was not on that list. So if I go back to the mono develop uh, editor and the public void do button. <coughs> then this is accessible outside of the script. And now when I look at this function, it should have uh, do button press. Uh, it should have do button press. Uh, make sure I save that, it probably still do button press. Um, it's always something that will go wrong in a live demo. Um, script, press script, do button click. Okay, it's updated now. Um, so in its simplest kind of hello world kind of way, uh, if I make sure it doesn't maximize on play, I should be able to see the uh, console. So when I press play, I've got a console down here. I can clear any of the, I can tell there's errors, somehow it's got errors in there. When I click on this button, it comes up down here, do button, and that will trigger that script that I'm working with. So a few other ways of working with the um, canvas. You can have a canvas in the world, in the 3D world. This is overlay in the camera. This is working as an overlay. So if I look at the camera, canvas script there, screen space overlay, that's the normal one you'd use on screens. If you want to actually have it in the world space, you can add, uh, change that to world space and you will find that that will be a game object just as the other objects are. So we would be able to move that into a position where it's visible. Um, it's a little bit larger than the rest of the scene, but that will move around as you move around in the scene as well. So generally working for, for screens, you will use screen space and you'll overlay that. Um, and you will want to look at the way these items are set up um, so that they can adapt to different screen sizes. So you do have ones that can stretch with the scene. Um, so when it goes on to a different screen size, you will get those uh, the reacting grip. So you can run these things on say 640 frames or the 4K monitor. And you want those to be able to adapt in that way. Got any questions for a minute before I move on? Okay, good. I'll just keep going. Um, you can obviously review this as you go forward. Now, uh, I'm not a programmer. I'm a, a visual artist who programs. Um, so my understanding of design patterns will be uh, not to the computer science level, but I do understand uh, MVC, Model View Controller. And the way I look at game engines is that really what you're doing is setting up a model. You're setting up a, a, like a database of the objects in there. Either the database will just be the objects themselves that can control themselves, but you're making that model of a, a scene in there. The view 
Unity engine will handle, and the controller class is something that you will set up to uh, take the inputs from the, the controllers, the keyboard, or whatever you're using, and adapt the model to work with that. So that's the way I, I look at it from that perspective. Uh, there's more information on that on the link, um, but there's also uh, an observer design pattern that is also one to be very aware of when you're working here. This is using event handling rather than the on-frame updates. Now, this is really useful because it's less, there's less computation um, when it's not looking every frame to find um, an item or to see if something's happened, to test an object. You're waiting for an event to happen and then that will trigger um, the actions for that as well. There's some links in there. I'm not going to go deeply into that because that's not my uh, specialism. But it's quite an interesting way of, of thinking. And the model class is something that I use extensively. So I, I would generally keep a, a C sharp script with all my variables in. And then I can find, I can, I can access that from all the other um, scripts that I'm working with. So I'll have a model class uh, like game model.cs. And within that, I'll declare the variables. When the game starts, I will set those variables and I can access that from different codes as I go. One of the things you think about when you're programming in this way, um, using scenes, you have application states. So what state is the application in? Is it playing the game? Is it in the menu? Uh, is it uh, looking at the options? Has it paused the play while it's in the options? Uh, is it pausing while someone's wants to answer the phone or something like that? Is it in a game over state? So these are quite important to actually tell it which user interface to bring on and you can select different items you need with that as well. There's also a system called finite state machines. Um, this is something to look into if you're looking at character animation. The finite state machines will uh, limit the amount of uh, options you have, but you may have a character that you want to animate to walk or run or jump. And that's something you can um, program within a finite state machine. Um, so do have a look at that. I'm not sure we've got time to cover that in detail today. Um, we have gone over some of this, this next script, uh, slide here, programming using scripts as components. How do you get variables from other scripts? This is what I was talking about with the, the models as well. So what you can do, I'll just give you a demonstration of this. I'm going to go uh, start a new scene again. Uh, save that one. And it's asking me about my normal maps that I've used and wants me to fix the definition of those. So I'll just fix those. Uh, so if I have a game object, um, which is going to control my script, or I'm going to attach my scripts to, and then I'll create some C-sharp scripts. So I'm going to call it Unity Intro Model, and then I'll have one uh, C-sharp script, uh, Unity Intro uh, Control. I'm using the, the model and controller aspects of that. So I'm going to drop both of those onto my game object script. Game object scripts there, which uh, I mean, might not have compiled those quite yet. Ah, I shouldn't use that dash, I don't think. I'll use the camel case lettering, and then it's come up in the right color. So uh, that's an error to look out for. So we need to match the name of the script to the class <coughs> inside the script. So it wasn't happy with that. Uh, we've been using a dash, and it put an underscore on this as well. So it wasn't happy at all. So I'll just change those, open them both up, and put the model here. So in the model, I will get rid of everything in this public class apart from the variables I might want to use. So public allows you to access this variable outside of this class. So public, um, I'm going to put int for integer, and static means it will be uh, 
viewable from all other objects. It will stay at the same, and then I will put uh, uh, my my int. So I'm declaring this variable there, and that's all I'm doing in the model. There's no functional programming going on in that model. Um, and from that, I would be able to say within my control here, I can say, uh, I think we're going to get rid of the start one. I just want to work on the update with this. So every time a frame ticks over, I can say uh, unity, uh, put a capital in there. Unity intro model, and that's come up with this in the uh, dot my my in, isn't it? I've got that the wrong way around. I've got static int. Uh, so that should allow me to plus equals. Uh, one. And that should allow me to uh, add to that and change that variable from outside of it. So as I'm moving forward here, uh, I just want to put that out to the, uh, the console <coughs> so I can see how that's working as I go forward. Sorry, my typing's not perfect there. Um, so now if I bring this control, I probably don't have to put the model on into the game um, into the game hierarchy, but I have to have this control one in there. So I'll add that one there as well. So I save that as a script demo. And I'm looking at this control uh, console down here, and that should give me the details of what's going on. So it's counting up. As we go forward. So every frame, uh, every time there's a kind of a tick going on, that can work. Just also want to show you a, another um, aspect of that as well. So I'm going to do public static again. I'm just going to copy paste that, but this time I'm going to make a float object uh, so I can use a decimal point um, uh, with this as well. So public static float, my float being the variable. Uh, then, because different machines will run at different frame rates, so you may be running this on a very old telephone, or you may be running this on the, the fastest gaming computer you can get, uh, they will run at different frame rates, depending on what you've got in the scene. So one thing you might want to do is, is work with a, an aspect called delta time, and that is a fraction of time that has passed since the last frame. So if you want something to move evenly, across different platforms, then we will work uh, with time.delta time. So uh, unity intro, so this is referring to the script. Then I would put my float equals uh, or plus equals uh, time dot delta time. Okay, so this will only add one every time there's one second. So this will really uh, mean that whatever platform you're working on, it will work at that speed. So uh, in this case, I will, uh, I can say my int, um, but I'll also add in for this uh, debug part um, the float as well. And we'll see how that kind of differs as they go forward. We'll see how many frames it's, it's done and uh, the difference between how that works. I need to get the capitalization right. Uh, so now when I'm working with this, I can see in the debug logger down here that, which if I pause the system, uh, the integer has counted up to uh, 116 here but that has taken 3.2 seconds. So that's really standardizing the amount of speed uh, that an item will move in. So that's a really important one to get the hang of early on, and that will standardize across different, um, different uh, platforms that you might be working on. Um, another thing we might want to do is access or tell an object 
which is in the scene to do something. So if I, uh, if I have a cube, I'm going to make that cube with this uh, script here. Um, I may have a script on there that I want to run at a certain point, or I want to tell it to run, or I want to tell it to run it under a certain condition. So, uh, just see where that cube is, and make sure it's in the main part of the scene. Ah, so that transforms off on the right side. So just get that in the main, the main window here. Uh, so I'm going to make a, a C sharp script, Unity intro object script. So this is a script for my game object, which I'll drop onto the cube. Uh, I'll open that one up, and again, I'm going to get rid of the, the scripts that are in there. Um, I'm going to call public void uh, do function, uh, open close brackets, and uh, open close curly brackets. Um, now, I may want an object to disappear from the scene, in which case I might look at something like destroy. So if I'm looking up how to get rid of an object from a scene, get this, the uh, scripting API, um, and if you know the right words, you're going to find these very quickly. So to remove a game object, you can say destroy game object, destroy this, uh, destroy game object in <coughs> five seconds. Um, so I'm going to just copy and paste that over into my, uh, my scene there. Game object refers to itself. Uh, but what I want to do is call that from the other, the other script. So what I can do with that is I can broadcast a message to that, uh, to that object. So inverted commas there, it's telling it which function to call and it's sending a variable as well along with that. So I'm going to add this into my control script, which I know will run. It's going to broadcast the message, and as long as I get the right uh, function there, so I'm going to say uh, do function, I'll swap that over. And now this should, I might have an error if it's expecting that variable to come through, which will tell me in this window that there's a, this will let me do that. Um, so as this runs, it should destroy that cube. Um, it's broadcast that message, and you can see that it's disappeared um, because it's called there. So it's highlighted there. As it plays, that actually disappears from the hierarchy. So we're broadcasting that message to all the children in the hierarchy of that object. So you can send a message to other objects to make them um, run a function. Uh, there is there is a lot more to that that we can get into, but uh, that's a one of the basics you might come up with if you're a programmer and you're moving into Unity. How do you send messages to, to, to things as well? You also have a concept called get component. How do you refer to the components you're working with so you can set those as well? So again, there's a script reference here. Um, component, get component, turns the value of that type. Now their example is hinge joints. So they're obviously looking at a um, a rig in there, but you may want to, um, if I just open one of the other scripts, uh, the ramp demo here, um, if we look at the canvas here, we might want to have a script on top of the canvas that changes the text of this button. Let's just scale that up so we can see that a bit better. Uh, find that in that window. Um, so this text here, we can address from a script. I'm not going to set it up now, but we can do get component and tell it to find uh, that component, and then we can refer to that here as well. So here it's saying hinge joint hinge. Uh, that's defining the type of object it's looking for, get component, hinge joint, and then it's using that as reference so you can actually then describe that as well. So you can describe the text of that object 
and you'll be able to update that um, within your item. Does that take that example script? Would it, would it, would it broadcast the commands every change joins object in your, in your scene, or would it just take this the first is one? Yeah, this is a slightly different example of the, the broadcasting. Broadcasting is sending up to all the objects in there and they will check to see if they've got that function and run that function if it's available. The get component is really to be able to uh, program and edit items in runtime. So if you have a, a game object and the script for that game object needs to access, for example, the text value uh, of that button um, to change it, then you would have to reference that item to be able to, to change the parameters of it. So you use the get component function to say, <coughs> what is my reference to describe that, that object. Because um, a lot of objects will have the same function. If I have several buttons in there, they'll all be called text. Um, and it's just a way of referring to the, the game object or the component that you want to address. You say get component, get the text component, um, and that will return that and you can use that um, within it as well. Um, that's one, yeah, you'll find that really useful when you get your head around that. That's kind of, that's more when you are programming and making user interfaces and that sort of thing. But it, it can uh, be involved with a lot of stuff. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so, you, so you're isolating a, a particular element within an object or an object itself. Yes. So this button has a text component uh, with it and you've got that has a text value within that as well so if you want to change that you, you just need to be able to refer to it in code and that's the way we do it um, so I, I did do a quick demonstration there of the destroy destroying an object um, the other elements you might want to work with are instantiate instantiate will create an object for you and this is where you tell it to instantiate, for example, one of your prefabs. Um, again, you might want to look this one up, but in this case, it's building a wall. It's got a, a loop, X and Y. Uh, game object cube equals game object create primitive, primitive type dot cube. So it's not actually using a prefab in this case. It's creating a cube. Uh, it's adding, it's referring to that now as cube. And as it goes on, it refers to that again and says, add a component rigid body. And then cube, it's setting up the position of that in relation to the x and y coordinates in part of the loop. So if we ran that script, it would create a brick wall for us um, with rigid bodies. So we'd probably be able to use physics on it. We might be able to launch an item at it and destroy it and have it shatter everywhere. Um, that's really uh, instantiating an object um, sometimes you will just say instantiate look up the, the coding version of that in, uh, and you use this all the time if you're working in games you're instantiating bullets or you're instantiating um, other items um, and the syntax for, syntax for that is instantiate prefab Prefab's a variable there, and the vector, new vector three, and that's describing where it is. Um, and in the first instance here, you're declaring a public transformer prefab, and you're attaching uh, an object to that. So you're declaring a variable to make that work. Um, so, and then the next example here is if you have input button, the get button down equals fire one, then it will instantiate a bullet for you as well. So there's, there's a lot of ways that works with game engines. Uh, tags I mentioned already, and collision events we've mentioned. Um, you can have a look at that. Uh, oops, I'm going to download that rather than the wrong button there. Uh, uh, collision events, click on that. Uh, Gliders, you have box gliders, so you can work with the, the items. You have triggers, and the handler for this is on collision enter. You'd have that on a script. On trigger enter, different ways of working with that, and that function will run as these uh, events happen. So then you process how that works within it. Um, 
also uh, tags, as I say, to know what an item is that you, you've collided with, you use tags and set that up for the items you're working with. So a prefab can have a tag attached to it already, which is an advantage of using tags, uh, prefabs over regular objects. And the destroy object will take the object out of the scene. So you might destroy an object, but you might instantiate an explosion when you destroy an object, and there's different ways of, of working with that. Now I'm really coming up to the end. I just want to go into one um, final part of working with Unity, which is animation. Animation working with the uh, transformations. The rect transformation here has the parameters of rotation, scale, and position. So that's a text one. <coughs> I'm going to make a new scene again. Uh, and let's create a game object of cube. So we're in that the transform has position, rotation, and scale. Now there's different ways of working with this. If I want this to move, I can add an animation component to this. Um, there is an add component button here. Um, and I should be able to put animator. Animator. And then it's got an animation controller that I can have attached to that as well. But I want to show you a different way of animating anyway, which is using something uh, called iTween, which allows you to uh, work with different systems, um, different coding, to make sure you get uh, uh, smoothing and uh, different items like that as well. So iTween is a way of using code to uh, bring your items together. I'm just going to open this in Unity from the, uh, the website. Just to load in some code again, which should bring me into the asset store. And Hidden. Running a little bit slow. Oh, there it is. So I can import that as a package from the asset store. Um, very simple scripts, but you can call different attributes of that um, as you're working forward. Um, so you can tell an object to move by a certain amount um, over a certain amount of time. And just look for where it's come in. Plugins. Uh, pixel placement, iTween. Um, within that, we've got a sample, so we'll have a quick look at that. Um, and we'll play and see how those objects are moving. If I maximize on play, it's a real smooth way. I use iTween to, to animate in and animate out um, objects. So in this instance, it's using code to tell the item to, to make some movement, but it's making it over time. This is different to moving it um, every frame uh, and calculating that movement as you go. So what we've got in there is a move sample and the move sample script. Um, apart from that, it is a regular script. In there, we're using the iTween command, so there's a library of code, iTween, move by, uh, game object, which is itself, iTween hash, x, it's moving the x dimension, two seconds, and it's got an easing type, easing out, exponential, loop type, ping pong delay. So there's a few different commands in there. It's very uh, um, easy to understand once you look at the, uh, the website for the uh, pixel placement. So do have a look at that. That's really useful. Um, and the other one is, again, you can just tell an object to move using the translate functions uh, as we're going forward. So let's move that on our script. So that's we're using code here. Uh, you can say translate vector dot forward times time delta. So you're moving something forward, you're moving something up, 
um, and you can work with <coughs> translations in different ways. So the transform functions are ones you want to look at when you're moving items. There's a lot of different um, aspects in there. You've got the position, the rotation, if you want to move, change the rotation or something. You will work with that uh, and you can do that. Again, they're using time.delta time so that it doesn't go at different speeds on different machines. Right, uh, the one thing that I didn't get to show you was the animator. There is a link to show you how to do that on here as well. Um, I haven't used that in a while, but you select parameters of the object and you can set up keyframes for them so that they'll move over time if you have that, if you have that need. Uh, that's the end of my introduction. I hope that set you up well and I hope that you will uh, enjoy exploring Unity and um, there are a lot of links on the uh, notes that I have as well. So if there's any questions now, please put them over to me. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you over the next uh, few weeks on the course. Thank you. Any questions? Bye. Bye. <laughs>